So we come to our passage of scripture for this morning and uh, for our good folks who are here with us uh, for the first time, we've been studying our way through the Gospel of Luke verse by verse and uh, we take about eight, ten verses at a time per week and, and so in today's passage, it's critical that we understand the passage that came immediately before this, we call it context. Uh, and so this morning, I want to give uh, you a quick quiz to make sure that we're all on the same page. And so uh, here we go. I, I'm sure you're going to be able to do well. And there's a bonus question in case you miss any of the, the main questions, all right? So uh, three weeks ago, we talked about Jesus and Peter and James and John going up onto a mountaintop and they had a, a mountaintop experience, a very special experience. And we refer to that experience as the transfiguration. transfiguration. See right there, you're batting 100% on your quiz so far. Now, uh, on top of that mountain, Peter, James, and John got to meet two of their childhood heroes. One hero was a Moses. And the other hero was Elijah. Elijah. Good. See, now you've, you're batting two for two, a thousand percent. Question number three: That special moment on top of the mountain, even more important than meeting their childhood heroes of Moses and Elijah, they got to experience the physical presence and hear the voice of God. God. Yes. You're batting three for three. Way to go. Good job. So and here's the bonus question. Well, well, actually one more question. Verse 37 through 45 tell us that when Jesus and James and Peter and John come down off the mountain, they are met by a crowd of people and the disciples, uh, the rest of the disciples, who were unable to, to cast a demon out of a young boy. And Jesus has to chastise the other disciples for their lack of what? Faith. Faith. Good. Good. You have 100% on your quiz right now. So here's the bonus question. You can get 110%. All right? Here's the bonus question. Immediately following that chastisement by Jesus of his disciples, he... Uh, tells the disciples that he's going to be a different kind of Messiah. That he's not going to be a king who is a military leader who comes in and kicks Rome out, but he's going to be a different kind of Messiah. He's going to not be a military Messiah, but he's going to be a what Messiah? Starts with an S. Savior, salvation would be a good guess, but it's not quite what I'm looking for. Spiritual would also be a good guess, but since I'm the teacher giving the quiz, that's not the one I'm looking for. Servant, suffering, Messiah. Yes, Jesus teaches them what the Old Testament has been teaching all along, that the Messiah isn't really going to be a political military leader, but the Messiah is going to be a suffering servant, a suffering Messiah, one who gives his life as a ransom for men. Yes, fulfillment of scripture. So that context is what brings us to our passage today. And verse 30, I'm sorry, in, in our passage today, in verse 46, an argument has broken out among the disciples about who of them, which of them, is going to be the greatest. Well, it might seem strange. Why would Luke want to record the disciples arguing about something that seems so petty? But to understand that, we have to know that they just had the transfiguration mountaintop experience. And that some of them couldn't accomplish what Jesus wanted them to accomplish. 
And so there's several things that I think are going on here to answer the question, why have this argument at this time? The first is that Peter, James, and John just came down off the mountain. And the rest of the disciples didn't get to go up the mountain. I think jealousy is one of the factors at play here. Peter, James, and John are feeling all puffed up. They had a mountaintop experience. The other nine disciples got to hang out in the valley. Didn't have that mountaintop experience. They're looking at Peter, James, and John a little sideways, like, why didn't we get to go up the mountain? What's so special about them that they got to go up the mountain? I think another thing that's going on here is that, that we know that Jesus had to chastise the nine who, uh, for their lack of faith. And I am betting that Peter, James, and John just kind of like slowly backed away from that chastisement. Like, uh, we weren't down here, Jesus. If we'd have been here, it'd have been different, but we weren't here. So go ahead and chew them out. We want no part of that. There's another factor that's going on here, and that's the whole idea of kingship. Again, these disciples, these young men and women, had been taught from the time they were little kids that to think one way about Messiah, and that Messiah was going to be a political military king. And Jesus is trying to get them to think in new ways. And to open the scriptures to them so that they understand that Messiah is not a political military leader, but is a suffering servant who came to give his life as a ransom. And so I mean, it's hard to let go of something that you thought was one way and you were taught is one way and to accept a new teaching. And so what we have going on here in this argument about who is greater and who's going to be greater is really the disciples jockeying for position. They're all still hoping that Jesus is going to be a political leader, that he's going to help raise an army, he's going to kick Rome out, and he's going to ascend the throne of Israel. And when he gets to be king, Peter wants to be the VP. James and John want to be secretary of the state. And Secretary of Defense. <clears throat> Thaddeus wants to be Secretary of Agriculture. I mean, each of the disciples are, are passing judgment on one another, and they're jockeying for position to see who is more important than whom so that they can have the positions of power in Jesus' new kingdom, in his new cabinet. We aren't any different. We judge one another. We determine value based on how people look and what people, where people live and what people drive. We are constantly judging one person to be greater than another. Let me give you some examples. Greatest boxer to ever live, Ali or Frazier or Tyson. Right? We, we could have, uh, if you know anything about boxing, we could have quite the argument about that. Yeah. Oh, there's another name that came up. Yeah. And then, oh, what if, what if we started talking football teams? You know, I, I could make a really, really good argument that the Pittsburgh Steelers are the greatest football dynasty ever. And your argument about the Ravens would be lame. <laughs> Sorry, Mark. <laughs> Mark and I kid each other about this all the time. Here's another one. Greatest basketball player ever. Oh, Dr. J, Michael Jordan, Kobe Bryant, LeBron James. I mean, we are constantly as human beings measuring things that against the other to determine whom we think is greater. For our motorcycle friends this morning, what's better? A better touring motorcycle 
A Honda Goldwing or a Harley? Indian. <laughs> Some of us aren't that rich. They don't cost any more than a Harley. <laughs> But, but we could, right? We have our opinions about what's greater, what's more important. And ladies, lest you, you think that I'm, I'm talking about only things that guys care about, I've seen women cut one another down over the way they dress, over where they get their hair done, over... <laughs> where they live, what they drive, and whom they married. I had the opportunity to go to the senior center this week, and um, while I was there, uh, well, I bet that if I had taken a checkerboard and declared myself at the senior center to be the best checker player, checker player ever, that I'd had some challengers. Right? We, we always want to measure where we are. You see, the world has polluted our thinking. It has caused us to think in terms of in and out and less and more. And the world is constantly working on us, telling us to build ourselves up because we need to be somebody. Because we don't want to be nobody that we have value and somebody has less value because if they have more value, we're not as valuable. You know, that's thinking of the world. And into this type of thinking comes our Savior. Into this world comes Jesus. And he says, oh, he tells his disciples and he tells us there's a different way to think. Jesus came for two specific purposes. And the first is what we're going to remember around the communion table this morning. That Jesus came to give himself as a sacrifice for our sins and to grant unto us salvation. The second thing that Jesus came to do that was equally as important was to show us the Father. To show us how God thinks. To show us what God values. To, to show us who our God is. And so in verse 47, Jesus proves that he's God and he reads his disciples' thoughts. And then he has a little child come stand next to him. And then he says these words in verse 48, Whoever welcomes a little child in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me, God. For he who is least among you all, he is the greatest. Now, you need to understand that at this point, like all of the disciples' jaws are hanging wide open. They are confused. Their minds have just been blown. They don't understand. I mean, they understand the pecking order of the world. They knew that they were nothing because they were just lowly fishermen. And they knew that Matthew was nothing because he was even worse than fishermen. He was a tax collector. But none of them ever thought of themselves as nothing like this little child. You see, in our society today, we value children. We highly value children. But it was not that long ago that our world did not value children. It was a common, everyday practice in Persian and Assyrian and Gr Greece and Rome. Common practice to put children out into the wilderness to die. It was called infanticide. And the father of every household had to weigh two things. How much was coming in and how much was going to go out to this extra mouth to feed. 
and the resources that this new baby was going to sap in terms of time and energy. And if the father deemed that the child was going to be a drain on the already strained resources, it was common practice, it was accepted to take that child out into the wilderness and abandon it to die. It was just accepted. My friends, do you realize that like 18 years ago, China was still doing this? My sister and her, brother, and her husband, my brother-in-law, went to China 18 years ago to adopt a baby girl that somebody dropped off on a doorstep because she wasn't valued and wasn't wanted. It was common practice in Rome to sell children to pay off debt, to sell them into slavery. It was common practice in Roman culture and in Greek culture to go to the pagan temple and have sex with children because that was considered worship. This was common knowledge. It was common thinking. Everybody thought that it was okay. This little child that's standing next to Jesus, everybody else looks at and thinks that child has no value at all. And Jesus takes this little child and says, in the kingdom of God, in God's way of thinking, this child is the greatest. The reason we value children today is because our Savior set that example on that day and his disciples started to get it. And his disciples made more disciples and taught those disciples that children were not throwaways, but children were valuable. <clears throat> children were not things to be sold into slavery or used as slaves, but they were to be valued and treasured because they were great in the kingdom of God. And our thinking today is directly because of the man named Jesus. And don't sit here this morning and think of yourself as, well, we're so much more civilized than those people back then. Because we're not that far away in our world today from going back. My wife works at uh, York Suburban School District in the counselor's office. She sees kids every day that are thrown away. No fathers. <coughs> mothers and fathers who don't care, who don't answer phone calls, who don't return messages, who don't come to mandatory meetings, who set horrific examples, and these children are broken. So broken that when they're pulled out of the local school and they're sent to Philhaven, Philhaven doesn't want them and sends them back. We're not that civilized as a society that we can't be polluted yet again by the thinking of the enemy who wants us to think that, oh, that's okay and that's common practice. You see, you need to understand that the world is constantly pressuring you to think like it. And God wants you to think and value the way he thinks. And that's why he gave us his word, and that's why he sent us his son, Jesus, to show us how he thinks and what he values. In verse 49, John just still doesn't get it. John points out to Jesus, he, 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 because there's a white hot spotlight shining on the disciples at this point. 
And John says, well, Jesus, we saw a guy healing people in your name, and, and we stopped him because he's not one of us. And Jesus has to correct John's thinking. See, John is still defining people as in and out, as us and them. And Jesus, and Jesus has to correct John's thinking and say, look, if they're not against you, then they're for you. Stop thinking of in and out and us and them. Stop placing value on people for who they are or where they live or what their station of life is. Here's another lesson for us to, to learn this morning. As we strive to change the way we are thinking from this world to the thinking of the kingdom, it's going to take time. I mean, Jesus has told them this, Jesus has challenged them on this, and John still doesn't quite get it. This new way of thinking, this new practice. It is going to take time to change our thinking from thinking like the world to thinking like God. Well, in verse 51, Jesus, it tells us, sets his face towards Jerusalem. That's the old King James version of verse 51. The verse that Cynthia read to you says that Jesus resolutely set his destination towards Jerusalem. Resolutely is a word we don't use very often today, but it simply means that Jesus has set his mind towards going to Jerusalem and nothing, absolutely nothing is going to distract him from accomplishing getting to Jerusalem. Why? Well, because God wants to accomplish through Jesus in Jerusalem his good and perfect will. God wants to accomplish salvation for everyone. And Jesus knows this, and Jesus is on board with this. Jesus knows he's going to have to suffer. He knows he's going to be tortured. He knows he's going to be killed horribly on the cross. But he's still on board because he loves the Father, and he wants what the Father wants more than he wants anything else. And here's yet another lesson for us this morning. Because the world challenges us and pushes us to look out for ourselves, and to, it's okay to want what we want. And Jesus says, look, there's a different way to think. How about you want what God wants? The creator of the universe. Want what he wants, because he knows what is best. Don't let anything distract you or dissuade you or tempt you to think in a, the way of the world, but resolutely set your mind on the things of God. Paul says this in his letter to the Romans. Be renewed by the thinking of your mind. Well, in verse 52 and 53, Jesus sends some messengers to the village ahead of them to, to find a place to stay and to get a little food in their stomachs. And these messengers go ahead to this village and they're promptly turned away. We want nothing to do with Jesus. You aren't welcome here. And in verse 54, we see James and John still thinking like the rest of the world. In verse 54, James and John are absolutely incensed. Like the Greek word that is used in that passage of scripture, think red-faced, fist-clenched, shaking in anger. James and John are absolutely beside themselves that this village would dare, dare to reject their Messiah. In their mind, Jesus is the next king. How dare they not welcome him with open arms? And then James and John ask Jesus, 
Can we call down fire from heaven and firebomb that village into dust? That's what they're asking. Now, I want to point two things out here at this point. The first is that these are the same disciples that back in verse 40 couldn't cast a demon down of a little boy. But now they can call fire down from heaven? <laughs> How's that work? I mean, I'm pretty sure that one is harder than the other. To firebomb a village is a lot harder than healing a little boy. And yet these same disciples who couldn't heal that little boy think they could now call fire down from heaven. Irony is not a strong enough adjective to use here. The second thing I want to point out to you is this. And I want you to let it sink in. James and John have been so polluted by the thinking of the world that they don't care that they just asked the Savior of the world if it was okay to bomb men, women, and children into oblivion. To let them burn alive. They think it's okay to pray that way, to ask Jesus if that's okay. Can you imagine? I mean, literally, can you imagine? Wrap your brain around, you, you kneel by your bed tonight to say your evening prayers. And your prayers go something like this. Jesus, thank you for today. Thank you for um, the food that you blessed us with. Thank you for our home and our jobs. We thank you that you love us. Thank you for uh, worship this morning with your people. Thank you for Pastor Don's sermon. It was truly amazing and awesome. And Lord, we love you. And Lord, those, those people that are mean to me, Bomb them with fire so they burn alive. Can you imagine praying that way? I can't. I mean, you know, people have made me mad. Don't get me wrong. People have made me mad. But I've never wanted to firebomb them. Yet alone ask God to firebomb them. In verse 56... I'm sorry, verse 55. Jesus does the only thing that he can do. Verse 55 tells us that Jesus looks at James and John and he rebukes them. That's a fancy Greek word for Jesus chewed them out. Because James and John are thinking like the rest of the world. They're not thinking like God. Elsewhere in the scripture, it tells us that when Jesus told the disciples that he had to go to Jerusalem to suffer and die, to accomplish, accomplish God's will, that Peter took Jesus aside and said, Jesus, don't talk like that. Nobody wants you to die. Nobody wants you to suffer. That's not, that can't be, possibly be God's will for you. And it says that Jesus looked at Peter and called him Satan said, get behind me, Satan, because you are thinking like Satan thinks. You're not thinking like God thinks. And I can't imagine that this rebuke for James and John is any less severe. Really, James and John? I've resolutely set my mind to go to Jerusalem to accomplish the Father's will, to provide salvation for everyone, including every man, woman, and child in that village that you want to firebomb. Really? As we come to the communion table this morning, Let's not be too hard on the disciples, on James and John. Because we too are, suffer from being, having our thinking polluted by the way of this world and the enemy to constantly judge others as in and out 
as valuable and less valuable. And as we come to the communion table this morning, let us be reminded that Jesus taught us differently and he lived it out in front of us. Jesus invited tax collectors to be his disciples. Nobody was more hated than tax collectors. Nobody was less valuable than tax collectors. And yet Jesus called a tax collector to be one of his inner core. Jesus, the scriptures tell us, ate with prostitutes. He was crucified between two criminals and told one of those criminals, today you'll be with me in paradise. Jesus offered forgiveness to the men and who were driving metal stakes through his hands and through his feet. As we come to the communion table this morning, there isn't a single one of us who is worthy to come to the table. But therein lies the beauty of our Savior Jesus. Because from our thinking, we have to prove ourselves worthy. We have to do something that makes us worthy. And in God's way of thinking, each of us is worthy because of his love for us. Not because of what we've done or not done, but because of who he is. That's the nature of our God, full of mercy and full of grace. And so as we come to the communion table this morning, I want to invite you to renew your commitment with me to continue to work on and practice changing the way we think about other people so that our thinking is in alignment with Jesus' thinking. And we value what Jesus values. And as we come to the table this morning, I, I would invite you to renew your commitment with mine to change the way we act, the way we practice becoming more like Jesus every day. Because in accomplishing Jesus, or in accomplishing God's plan, Jesus died for everyone. And he rose again for everyone. And so let us resolutely set our minds this morning to living and thinking like our Lord. Let's pray together. Thank you, God. The people of the Peach Bottom Charge of the United Methodist Church Pray that you found today's message to be one of encouragement, one of challenge, and one that made you or helped you grow in your faith. If you'd ever like to know more about what a life of following Jesus is like, we pray that you would consider joining us on Sunday morning. Mount Olivet meets at 8.45, Bryansville meets at 9.45, and Mount Nebo meets at 11 o'clock. You'd be welcome at all three churches, and you will find in us not a people who live perfectly, but a people who show grace to one another, because God's grace is for everyone.